things. <laughs> okay, well, uh, this is not going to be a funny story. Uh, curiously, it, it involves my father as well. He was, uh, like many men, really enjoyed the outdoors. He could go and walk through the woods for hours and he would collect things that he found, little grotesque roots and turtle shells and bones and so forth. Uh, he loved nothing more than to spend an afternoon in a boat with a line in the water. And if he caught a fish, that made it even better, but if he didn't, there was nothing wrong with that at all. Um, he loved to watch sports. He didn't really play too many sports, but he was a fit man. Uh, so in those ways, he was like, like many men, that, uh, uh, many American men anyway. Uh, but he was also something of a Renaissance man, too. He was uh, a philosophy major until he realized that there were no jobs for philosophers. <laughs> so he changed to uh, psychology, and then he took his first abnormal psychology class, and he realized he did not want to do that, which is ironic because he married my mother, and she had all kinds of uh, yeah. mental difficulties. Um, and then, so he ended up as an English major, um, and he went and he was teaching high school. Uh, but after being an English major, he decided that his real love was in art. So he became a visual artist, and he taught at the University of Georgia. Um, he, he was a painter and a sculptor and a potter. He did every possible kind of art that he wanted to, and he didn't sell the works. He just loved to make them. He'd had a bad experience once at a gallery and um, the, the gallery owner wanted them to reduce the price of the work. And he said, uh, do you know how much time and effort and imagination I put into this? Yes, but $75 is enough. And so he never sold his art. He would come up, if you came over to the house and you liked something, he would give it to you. He, he didn't necessarily need to keep it, but uh, he wasn't in it for commercial glory for sure. He wooed my mother with poetry. This was in 1950s in Georgia, and there were not many men who even knew what the uh, Rubiat of Omar Khayyam was, much less could quote it by heart. And she was an aspiring poet, so she really thought that this was romantic. And together they had kind of a bohemian lifestyle. In 1950s Georgia, they lived together before getting married, and that just wasn't done at the time. Um, my brother and I must have been, in some ways, a disappointment to him because neither of us shared the love of sports, neither of us shared the love of the outdoors that, that he had that was so important to him. My brother was a rock and roller and he played the electric guitar and he had all the girlfriends and he was very, very, very popular in school. And I was three years younger than him, <laughs> and uh, where he was good looking and tall, I was short and fat, <laughs> and with bad eyesight, and uh, I looked up to him so much. He, w he also was a, uh, a wonderful visual artist as well, um, and I wasn't really very good at that, although perhaps it was because I was three years younger. No one ever said. I should be as good as him, but I always thought that I should be, which was unrealistic, of course, for me. At any rate, my father was really the tower of strength in our family. So it was a great shock when Thanksgiving rolled around and the day before it, he'd gone to the doctor because he hadn't been feeling very well and the test results came back. And he was about 65 years old, and the doctor told him that you've got pulmonary fibrosis, which is a lung disease that gradually suffocates you. And um, he was told that he had about a year to live. So it was a very, very tough time. We always thought that my mother, I think all of us in the family, thought that my mother would go first and that dad was like a rock and he would stay around forever. Well, it was unquestionably the worst year of my life, and I'll spare you many of the details, but uh, one time we were talking with him, and he started talking about what he wanted for his funeral service. And he said, what I really want 
is a Viking funeral. <laughs> and you know, in a Viking funeral, they take the hero out, they put him on the longboat, they set the thing afire, and they shove it out, and it goes out, right? And, and we had a little motorboat. <laughs> we had some lake property. Um, but he, he said, well, of course that's impossible. Um, but he wanted to be cremated, and uh, he wanted to have Beethoven's Ode to Joy play at his funeral service. Um, time came and I got a call. Your dad's doing okay. You don't need to rush. And I said, that's fantastic. And then three days later, I got a call that said, you better get here as quick as possible. And of course, I'm in Hong Kong and they're in Georgia. And I didn't make it. My brother was with him at the end. Uh, but my brother went out to smoke a cigarette, and when he came back, Dad was gone. I kind of think that he wanted to go alone. Well, we had the, the ceremony. We had Beethoven's Ode to Joy. We had a bagpiper. It was really something. And then we're left with what are called the cremains, <laughs> which is just a horrible name. And they are horrible things. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but you think ash. Oh, it's light and fluffy. It's not. Uh, and there's little bits of bone, and then there's these weird friggin' blue things. What is that? I have no idea. Um, and we were going to um, empty them in Lake Hartwell, the lake that we had the property at which is what he'd asked for. But then my brother came up with a plan, and he made a Viking boat out of balsa wood. He carved a dragon at the front, little shields along the side. There was a, uh, a captain's house. There were masts. It was incredible, uh, about that long. And uh, we put Dad's cremains on that and poured lighter fluid on it. It had been a stormy day, but it was suddenly calm. And so he lit the Viking boat and he pushed it out in the water. And I turned on some Wagner. <laughs> and the boat sat out there, and it was completely still, and it burned, and we listened to Wagner, and we watched it, just the three of us, my mother and my brother and I. Now, my brother had had a difficult relationship with my father, because they were so alike. And everything that my father had done wrong, he saw my brother doing, and he would try to stop him. And of course, that doesn't work when you're a rock and roll rebel. But uh, the thing burned, and then it burned, and it burned some more, and some more, and we're starting to go. <laughs> <laughs> Balsa wood floats forever. <laughs> Finally, my brother says, I'm going to go out there and sink it. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> so I don't know if there's life after death, but I sure hope there is because I want my dad to know what my brother did for him and that he got his Viking funeral after all. Thank you.